good morning. Um, uh, my name is Power, John Power. I'm a, a lecturer in the School of Nursing and Midwifery at Queen's University in Belfast, which is uh, on the outer reaches of the United Kingdom. Uh, I uh, both teach to, uh, but also research in, in social psychology, and it was from that and from discussion with some students, particularly including some issues that emerged with my personal students as their, as their personal tutor, that I first became interested in the area of, of disordered eating. Um, eating, of course, is a significant social dimension of life, um, important not just nutritionally, but also, and significantly for younger students, a way of developing or helping to develop their social matrix, bonding, um, and is an issue which for those that suffer with disordered eating, rather than becoming a positive element of life, can become quite a distressing element of life. So the theoretical basis for the study, uh, four key theories there, the, the idea of positive psychology rather than the pathological uh, idea of psychiatry, Spectrum theory, liminal theory, that is the periods in life when there's a degree of plasticity, the opportunity to, to, to reform things, um, and salutogenesis. I'll talk a little bit about uh, salutogenesis particularly uh, as we move through. The context then, disordered eating represents an over-focus on body shape and weight with abnormal and disruptive attitudes to food patterns and eating probably more conventionally read or interpreted it within the context of an eating disorder. But applying uh, what's called spectrum theory, the classical eating disorders, anorexia, bulimia, and such like, would sit at one end of the spectrum. I was more concerned with those who don't have clear manifestations of um, an eating disorder, but sit more subclinically, uh, and it's rather concealed. It's not evident, and certainly wasn't evident in the, um, in the students I spoke to, uh, unless, of course, uh, they reveal it to, to, to individuals, as they, as they did, thankfully, in, in our study. Um, notwithstanding, it carries significant psychological, social, and importantly, physiological problems or risks, and, of course, can become a chronic and intractable condition uh, if it's not addressed early enough in life. What's evident from the literature, and the literature had been predominantly, the pre-existing literature of, of relating to university students um, and disordered eating, had been predominantly uh, of a quantitative nature. This is a qualitative study, but predominantly of a quantitative nature. And what was evident from the literature, and again evident uh, or emerged within the study, is that um, it carries a stigma. Like eating disorders, like anorexia, bulimia, and such like, it carries a stigma, and evidently a number of the students felt stigmatized by this. Consequently, they concealed it and didn't disclose it. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more, more about that as we move on. Figures then, what, what, what's, what's the, 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 the extent of the problem? Uh, the literature is fairly broad on that, but the range, uh, according to the literature, and it's substantially quantitative, uh, quantitative as, as I suggested, ranges between about, been about 10, 12 percent, uh, up to uh, 20 and more percent of university students, younger university students, who suffered with or are at risk from disordered eating. Even if one takes the lower end of, say, a figure of about 10%, for our own university school, that's the School of Nursing and Midwifery, we, we have an intake, we have two intakes a year. Uh, collectively, that would amount to about uh, 450 um, midwifery and nursing students, so nursing students across all the fields of nursing, 450 students, 
and it, applying a, a principle of about 10%, that would be 45 students, about 45 students or some more, who are potentially at risk, either struggling with disordered eating or at risk from disordered eating. So that's a significant number of students, even in our own school, uh, let alone the whole university. Um, so what, uh, taking um, students who were involved in in health-related degrees, health-related higher degrees, uh, who one might expect, this was undertaken at the end of their first year of study, but one might expect that they had some insight to disordered eating or eating disorders, stress management, coping mechanisms, the extent of the support that was available in the university and such like. So taking those students, who interviewed um, 12 students. There was a pilot study with some, some, some other students initially, but for the core study, 12 students drawn from nursing, midwifery, and um, medicine. All the students were either were 25 years and under, so it was the, yo the younger, younger age range of students, uh, all, all studying to professional health-related degrees. Um, importantly, what, what one was focusing on was their understanding of disordered eating, whether they understood what it was, understood the risks involved, um, where they understood it was coming from, what was, what was driving it, and importantly, what they thought the university could do to help better support them. In-depth interviews that were thematically analyzed and the, the overall narrative uh, was also analyzed as well. Um, and the analysis was drawn against a conceptual framework which significantly reflected against the theory of salutogenesis, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, particularly the key themes of salutogenesis, which are comprehensibility, manageability, and meaningfulness. Salutogenesis then, uh, drawn from the theory first developed by Antonovsky, is, is about saluting life, is a health-promoting approach to life, health-promoting approach and outreach, focuses on the positive promotion of health. What, what builds and sustains health? Why do some individuals suffer illness whilst other individuals don't suffer illness? Why do some individuals suffer misfortune while other individuals don't suffer misfortune? Now, there could be a number of elements there, but what Antonovsky was, suggested, was suggesting that there are building blocks to resilience. There are building blocks to resilience. Focus less on pathogenesis and more, and importantly, on the social matrix, the context in which individuals live that helps to support them, either build or restore a sense of health and well-being. Antonovsky talks about the river of life, that we're all, all in the river of life, and sometimes it can be a bit, the water can be a bit choppy, Sometimes uh, it can uh, be quite precipitous and quite, quite dangerous. But what helps to sustain, to build and sustain our, our sense of health, our sense of well-being, well the resilience and a sense of coherence in our life. What are the resources that an individual needs? And those include material resources, cognitive resources, emotional and interpersonal resources. And according to Antonovsky's theory, the greater the sense of, of, of coherence, the better able one is to swim in the river of life. The better able one is to build and sustain health. And importantly, what one was focusing on an important part of what one's focusing on in the study is what was the, the students, the undergraduate, these young undergraduate students, all in health-related degrees, what was their sense of coherence or lack of it? <laughs> um, the three key elements then of the sense of coherence, comprehensibility, manageability, and meaningfulness. And what Antonovsky is essentially addressing there, as I interpret it, is in terms of comprehensibility, is an individual's comprehension of life, 
particularly and including issues in health, reflecting their lived experience, but a, 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 an internalized assurance or reassurance that there is some degree of order, balance, logicality, and purpose in, in, in life. Another important element then is the manageability. The sense that an individual is reasonably in control of their life. And that when stressors emerge, they have both the coping skills and can select the appropriate coping skill to, to address that, that, that stressor. And again, manageability, according to Antonovsky's theory, is significantly about the social matrix, the supportive matrix in which the individual has grown and emerged and perceives themselves as existing or operating within. And finally, meaningfulness. That, that life has a sense of purpose, that their life has a sense of purpose, that they have value, that they have primacy, and that there is real worth in the individual investing time and resources in significant challenges. And in this case, their first year and ongoing years in university, but also in the other challenges that the individuals, um, uh, individuals uh, felt that they faced. I'm not going to go through that in, in, in any detail, don't, don't worry. <laughs> just, to, uh, just, just a picture of the, uh, the, the conceptual framework and the conceptual structure. So the theory of salutogenesis, the three concepts of comprehensibility, manageability, and meaningfulness, as then, and, as, and then as one was moving through the theory, uh, moving through the analysis rather, the stage, uh, stage three emergent themes and the stage four uh, sub-theme. Sub so that, that's, that's how, the, how the, the, uh, the study was structured when it came to uh, analysis. The first year at university is significantly stressful. That's evident both common sense, in terms of common sense, but certainly evident from, from experience of the study, but also very evident from the, from the, um, from the literature. That can be positively stressful or eustressful, or it can be distressful. For a significant number of the students that, uh, that I interviewed, the, the first year at university was distressful. And part of that, of course, was their struggle with, with, with food and their eating patterns. In many cases, and again supported by the literature, there were pre-existing drivers. It wasn't necessarily their arrival at university that was causing the problem. The, the, the problems pre-existed. And perhaps in many cases, arrival at university merely topped, topped that or acute, added an acute stressor to a raft of chronic stressors. Significantly, the issue would be, and, and Eating disorders traditionally are dealt with in a pathological sense under the psychiatric model, DSM-5 type, type level. Are students, in this case students, struggling with uh, disordered eating, or many of them, are they mad? Are they psychiatrically damaged? Or are they troubled and struggling in life? And particularly, is their sense of manageability, their sense of control of life, disrupted? And their response to chronic stress manifesting, in this case, in terms of their distur disturbed or disordered eating patterns. Positive psychology would focus on the building blocks of mental health rather than pathologizing mental illness. And importantly, the um, university's opportunity to use the first year of studies, the first year of arrival at university, as a liminal opportunity. Using the plasticity in life, that plasticity in cognition, plasticity in perception, 
that this can present to students to use it more positively, to help them to change direction or build or rebuild that resilience. Key issues emerging from the study were, were then um, that, that a significant number of students did not understand disordered eating. The fact that they didn't have classic, as they interpreted it, classic anorexia or bulimia meant that they didn't have an issue. But then many of them realized that they did have an issue, but they certainly didn't realize the potential consequences of that. Evidently, a number of the students were using their eating patterns as a means of stress coping. Although the, the study wasn't specifically focused on that, that was evidently emerging from the narrative. The stress of the, their disturbed eating patterns was actually contributing to their isolation. Given that, again, food, uh, eating is an, is a, is a, is a, is an important element of, of um, social intercourse. And certainly in the first few months of arrival at university would be part of the relationship building and bonding processes or the, 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 the structure that would help to sustain that. And rather than being seen as it would with many students, many younger people, they would look forward to eating and enjoy the idea of being out, invited out to a collective meal and things that would actually raise considerable stress levels for these students. Either they would seek to avoid that, or they would mask the fact that they wouldn't eating, or they certainly wouldn't eating in the same sorts of quantities that the others were. <coughs> Most of the students saw disordered eating as a mental health issue. Reticent to acknowledge it, and very wary of the academic and professional consequences if they admitted it. They would not. I was very grateful that eventually they were a very hard to reach group. It was difficult to engage initially, but, but very grateful that they did speak to me, but evidently they were very wary of addressing this to personal tutors or any of the, uh, of the supportive mechanisms within the university. Consequently, their disordered eating was concealed and it was a subclinical experience. A significant number of the students were wary uh, and uncomfortable about eating in public refectories. Not just the noise, but the idea of eating in, in front of a larger number of, of, of students. They felt disproportionately, and that's a, a, a misperception on their part, but it, it is their perception, not, not, not our perception. They perceived that others would be observing what they were eating. So large refractories, noisy refractories, do not support uh, those that are at risk from disordered eating. Significantly, uh, almost all of the students felt very positive about their arrival at university, and that, that set, sat quite well with the theory of liminality, that there was a real liminal opportunity there to take their lives forward that could be better supported by the university. And most of the students, certainly those that were significantly struggling with or had been struggling with their eating patterns, felt that this could add significantly to their repertoire as healthcare professionals in the future, although they felt that the schools of nursing and midwifery and medicine would not see it as such. The schools would pathologize it, and of course, either they would be very closely monitored or they would be asked to leave their studies if it was discovered that uh, they, they had this problem. However, they felt, they felt that it could be it could add significantly to their repertoire in the future as healthcare professionals. Impacts then on the individual sense of self, on their first and later years of study, it doesn't suddenly go away. If the first year doesn't work well, then that significantly impacts second, third, fourth years. An unready or an unstable self-image and, and sense of self-efficacy was significantly impacted evident waste of resources, reduced scholarly focus, um, and increased levels of acute on an already existing raft of chronic stress. What could a university do then? It's our particular university, possibly <coughs> there might be generalizable elements from this as well. 
um, it could further develop its outreach to new students. It, it doesn't do as well as it could in that regard. Particularly, it could better facilitate, better develop, better outreach stress training. A number of these students evidently couldn't manage stress well. Their stress coping mechanisms were limited. And again, remembering these were, these were end of first year healthcare professionals. So they had limited repertoire of stress management. The students need to be better aware, particularly in our university and this, this particular group, better aware of the support facilities that already exist. The university, Queen's University isn't great, but its, its support facilities uh, structure for students is actually very good. Evidently, a number of these students didn't either appreciate that, didn't understand what was available, and certainly were not reassured of the confidentiality of those, those, those uh, support services. So that could be better, better delivered. What's delivered in the first few weeks um, with people coming in and talking to them evidently doesn't, doesn't embed properly. So that, that, that message needs to be enforced and reinforced over the year. University needs to refocus on positive mental health rather than mental illness. To help reduce the stigma and negative labeling attaching to mental health uh, issues and better encourage students to come forward and flag up if they think they have issues and concerns. Better and more consistent training and understanding, <coughs> particularly for those in healthcare and student healthcare in the university, better understanding of the fact that there is this potential subclinical concealed group of students struggling with their eating patterns. Small changes, not involving large amounts of money, but small changes to refractory eating areas to provide smaller and more discreet areas that might encourage these students to, to better eat during the day or, 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 or more likely to take something to eat and join in smaller groups rather than the bigger groups. Um, and finally, the university could use the liminal period, that first few months, that first year of university, to better embed a stronger sense of coherence. That getting to university is a real opportunity, that they're really valued, and to use this opportunity um, to move them towards more positive sense of self, sense of mental health, sense of their future. And that's our university, or that's the, the uh, uh, Lanyon building in the university. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Thanks John. So now I would like to open the question to the floor. Is there any question for John? Uh, John Potter, uh, this is John Sangli from South uh, Korea. Uh, thank you for delivering very interesting and very significant topic to us. As you mentioned that in that particular age, the, uh, their stress may be the great contributor for disturbing their eating pattern. But uh, I think uh, their eating pattern is, must be linked with their day and night cycle as well. So do you have any plan to expand your topic to the molecular basis? In that case, I can help you. I can collaborate with you. And I, I, didn't, I didn't catch all of the question, but I think I understood what you were saying. Yes is the simple answer. Mm -hmm. this, was, this was more of a pilot. We had piloted the, yeah. the, uh, the interviews and things, but this was, this was a small-scale study. Yes, indeed. Yes, yes. It, um, so so uh, the, the rhythmic, uh, circadian rhythmic changes in the molecular basis, that may be a great contributor for uh, elucidating the uh, molecular basis of the eating pattern. So uh, if you have any plan to expand your topic, then I can, I'm happily want to help you or we'll collaborate. Be very interested, you. yes. Okay? Be very interested, Thank you. yes, certainly, certainly, yes. Uh, just a comment rather than a question. I, 
I find it very interesting, your use of salugenesis. I really like that positive approach to this area rather than pathologizing it. Yeah. And uh, I, I would think that you would meet with a lot of success by using that approach. Antonovsky's uh, theory is a, is a, when one I probably didn't do it justice there, but it really is a very, a very interesting, well thought through um, and health promoting theory with some significant studies on the application of the theory uh, as, a, as, a, as a practical health promoting approach. But the, um, certainly our university could do more in terms of the developing a better sense of coherence in these students, yes, yes. Hmm. All right, thank you, Sean, thank you.